be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Here we have the last four verses of the Gospel of Matthew. Right? Last week we had Easter. Last week was Easter morning, right? And we, we read the first ten verses where the ladies went to the tomb and there was a big earthquake and the rock rolled back and the guards fell down like they were dead and Jesus is alive and we're all happy. And now we have the four verses at the end where it says, Jesus went to Galilee and met the eleven disciples. Why are there eleven? Judas. Judas. Judas is no longer part of the group. So... And in the beginning of Acts, they'll actually replace Judas, so there's 12. 12 is an important number. Why? Confirmation student? There's 12 what in, in Israel? There's 12 tribes in Israel. 12 is a very important number in the Bible. There's 12 tribes in Israel, so the 12 disciples are one for each of the 12 tribes. 12 is a, you know, there's 24 Elders that sit around the throne in heaven, 12 and 12, right? So it's a very important number. There's only 11 now because Judas has committed suicide because he handed Jesus over. So the 11 disciples go to meet Jesus on the mountain in Galilee where Jesus told them to go. And what did they do? The text says they worshipped, but some doubted. We'll come back to that and then Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, so I send you out into the world. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and remember, teaching them everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's a great commission. Jesus commissions the eleven disciples to go and tell everyone what has happened, how he taught them to live, and how they should live as well. So my question to you is, is that commission just for those 11 disciples that were on that mountain that morning? Or that day? I got one emphatic no up here, and the rest of you are what I expected. Right? We don't want to do that. That's something we want the evangelism committee to do, right? Let's get the evangelism committee to do that. Those of you who are on council should get a good chuckle out of that, right? Our evangelism committee is non-existent right now. So let's give that to the evangelism committee and let the evangelism committee do it. Right? Because we don't want to go out and talk about our faith. How many of you have ever, and I'm not, please don't raise your hands. This is one of those um, questions that I don't really want an answer to. Right? How many of you have ever shared your faith with someone else? How many of you more than once in your life have ever shared your faith with someone else? I ask you this not to make you feel bad if you haven't. I ask you this to say that this is something that every last one of us as a disciple of Christ should be doing. And sometimes we don't even have to say anything, right? St. Francis of Assisi is attributed a quote that he never actually said, but it's a good thing to think about. He's attributed with a quote to, of saying, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. He never actually said that, but it's a great attribute to think about in a way that we should live our lives, right? Our lives should so put forth the understanding of the love of Christ that we have that he has for us in our lives, that we've been so richly blessed, that the things that we do just overflow into the world as the gospel being poured out into everything that happens around us. And if people don't get it, then we tell them, I do this because God loves me. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to go out and make disciples. We're supposed to go out and help others know who Jesus is. And how do we make disciples? How do you make a disciple? Teach them. Is that the first thing you do? There's a specific order here. Go, therefore, into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I've taught you. How do you become a disciple? Martin Luther would say, you come to the font and you get baptized. 
And then you learn about what it is and what you're supposed to be doing. How many of you are baptized? You could raise your hands for that one. <laughs> right? In baptism, we don't talk about this, but I, the, one of the podcasts I listened to to prepare for sermons talked about how in baptism, it really is an exorcism. We don't talk about that because we, we normally see little kids up here, right? You don't want to think about babies being exercised. But when you were washed in those waters, all of the sins that you've ever done and all the sins that you ever will do are washed away and God claims you and names you and frees you from anything that has bound you or will ever bind you. It's an exorcism. It's something that brings you into a life with God. That's what it's about. Being with God in life and understanding whose we are and what we are sent to go and do. Now I said I'd come back to something just a minute because the most interesting part of this text is not the Great Commission where God sends every one of us, right? Not just pastors, but everybody, all disciples of Christ are to go into all the world and share their faith, baptize people and teach them about what God has called each and every one of us to do and always remember that God is with us. So we get this pesky little verse in here, verse, I believe it's verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Who are the ones that worshipped, and who are the ones that doubted? Right? The way this sentence is constructed, it makes us think that there's two different groups of people here this, at, on the mountain. And who's on the mountain with Jesus? The 11 disciples is all, we, is all we know, right? The 11 disciples went to Galilee in the mountain which Jesus directed them. So who are the some that worshipped? And who are the some that doubted? Actually, they all worshipped. Right? Or did they all worship? The next question beyond that is, can you worship and doubt at the same time. Is doubt the opposite of worship? Is doubt the opposite of faith? That's the big question this morning. Is doubt the opposite of faith? If I doubt something, can I have faith in it? I see a couple of heads going like this, which is good. Because you can because here's the thing about this sentence. It says in the original Greek, they worshipped and they doubted. When the translators translated this part of Matthew, they said people cannot possibly worship and doubt at the same time. So this can't be right. This must be an inflection on, the, on a certain construction of one of the words that allows for there to be put in a word to, to help clarify this more. So the people that translated it said all of the disciples worshipped, but there had to have been another group that was there, and, that, and that's the group that doubted. So we're going to put some doubt in. When in actuality, the verse actually says, and Matthew actually said, that when the eleven disciples saw Jesus on the mountain, they worshipped him because they knew who he was. But they doubted because they couldn't understand it. It doesn't mean they didn't believe in what Jesus said and that Jesus was standing in front of them. So the fact that they questioned what had happened and what is going on. It's to say that we're allowed to ask God about what's happening in our lives. It's to say that we're allowed to ask God about questions about things that we don't understand. It's to say that we're allowed to have faith in Jesus and know that he's always going to be here for us, but to not understand or to question what's going to happen next. The difference is, do you allow the doubt to keep you frozen where you are, or do you allow your faith and your belief in what God has promised you to let you step out in faith and know that God is always going to be with you? It's to show us that we don't have to have it all right before we come to God. I saw an interesting picture this past week about some preacher who talked about how um, churches, for those who have it all together, it's like go, waiting till you stop bleeding before you go to the ER. Right? You don't wait till you stop bleeding before you go to the ER. And you don't wait till you have everything all together before you come to church. 
Because this is where we learn about who we are and how our lives are all messed up. But in the midst of all of that, God still loves us and thinks of us more than he does any of his, all of his creation. And loves us and is never going to leave us. So this week, the week after Jesus rose from the dead, and he met his disciples on the mountain and sent all of them, just as he sends all of you, go into the world and share your faith. Share your life. Share the love that God has for you. And it's okay to question what's going to happen. Just don't ever question that God is with you. Remain strong and steadfast in your faith. And no matter, know that no matter what comes your way, that he's always going to be with you, even to the end of the age. So go and share his love so that everyone can know just exactly how much God loves them. Thank you.